great. Okay, guys. Okay, look, uh, thank you very much um, for uh, coming to the session. I just want to kick off by just introducing um, our guests here today who are going to present. So there's Hamiora Balkit, and Hamiora is the uh, Executive Director of Water Service Policy at Department of Internal Affairs, um, and is going to actually walk through what the uh, local water um, local water done, done well, well <laughs> framework and legislation uh, and the timeliners and the options and what is available to answer some of the questions. We also have um, some old friends, uh, um, Gabriel Huria and Nikki, Nicola Sherlaw from Naitahu, who are here um, um, just as uh, partners with us and uh, so they can listen. And also, if you have any questions, they're happy to answer questions. So um, this uh, is really the first uh, full workshop we've had about this. We intend to be coming back with a, reg a report potentially next week, information report, um, and also regular briefings and workshops about this because it's a critical pathway we've got going forward. So Do we need to read that or not? Not really. No. Okay, Kira. Um, and uh, that, and um, so we'll hand over to um, Hamiora to and, and walk Ray. us through the framework. Welcome. Oh, tēnā tātou. Uh, ina mana whenua o tēnā rohi, naitahi, tēnā koutou. Uh, Gabriel, tēnā koe e ho, uh, tēnā koe uh, mō te mahi o te kaupapa o tēnā rā. Kia ora. Uh, e te hea mana, your worship, me major, tēnā koe. Uh, welcome, thank you, Mary, for the introduction. Um, my name is Hamiora Balkit. Um, I'm the last man standing <laughs> left from the previous government's three waters reforms. Uh, <laughs> um, it speaks, speaks volumes to my ability to work for the, the government of the day. Um, but jokes aside, um, uh, I have, um, for transparency's sake, um, basically enacted, amended, then repealed um, all the previous government's Three Waters legislation, and then with Minister Simeon Brown um, have embarked on Local Water Done Well and its legislative and policy program. So I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased to be um, working um, on Local Water Done Well. I have a set of slides here, and I'm not, I'm not going to slavishly um, adhere to them, and I'm going to try and leave quite a lot of time for questions if I if I can. What time do we finish? Uh, we've got an hour. Okay, okay. Um, and there were some points that Mary supplied to me that um, I might try and focus on where, where, where I can. Um, but just very quickly... Obviously, the, the government has announced its uh, local water done well policy that was announced last year. Um, and I think the key elements is uh, there are no mandated structures or governance arrangements being put forward by the government. And local water done well is about returning the ownership of assets to communities and ensuring communities make their own decisions about how water services are managed and delivered into the future. Um, having said that, there are some elements to local water done well that I think distinguish it from the previous government's reforms. Uh, local water done well has at its heart uh, an economic and quality regulation regime, which I can talk to further. Um, and the intent of the minister is to introduce um, service delivery models and financing structures that councils can take on board if they so wish. Uh, to make it easier to access long-term finance for water infrastructure investment. Uh, there will be elements to the um, regime, which include a tool called water service delivery plans, which I'll talk about further. And these are plans intended for councils or groups of councils, if they so wish, to put forward their proposals for um, delivering water services investment infrastructure and services over the next few years. Uh, look, just very quickly, um, the government moved rapidly to shut down the Three Waters program. Uh, so the National Transition Unit has been shut down, and so has the Iwi Māori Directorate within the Department of Internal Affairs. Uh, what remains is a unit that I lead that is responsible for delivering um, local water done well legislation program, 
and has retained a small group of experts from the National Transition Unit um, to assist with policy and some of the mechanisms that I've been speaking to. Just for your information, the Department of Internal Affairs has made available all the information that was previously held by the National Transition Unit, and this can be accessed through a collab system that the department has, has established. And I can provide more information on that or, or details if that, is, if that is desired. Just um, to set it out in one place, so this is a the legislation plan that the minister is working to. He, he talks about Bill 1, Bill 2, and Bill 3. Um, Bill 1 was basically the repeal legislation, which we enacted in February, so that repealed the previous government's Water Services Entities Act and the Legislation Act. Um, we are very close to having his second bill, which is called the Local Government Water Services Preliminary Arrangements Bill. It's a very snappy title. Um, very close to having that introduced um, before the end of May. And that bill will set out the framework for water service delivery plans, some of the early elements for the economic regulatory regime. Uh, it has some um, provisions to try and assist councils if they wish to set up CCOs to make that a faster streamlined process. And as you may have heard in recent announcements, there'll be some bespoke legislation for Auckland Council and water care to make water care financially separate from um, the council. The Minister's final bill, <clears throat> which is a local government water services bill, and that, that's what he, what he calls bill three, that will be introduced before the end of the calendar year and that will set out the full, the full regime. So the economic regulatory regime, uh, the minister's, I guess, um, what he calls his backstop, backstop powers and interventions um, and any other matters that need to be introduced for the enduring regime for water services. I've spoken about the Repeal Act, so I'll um, move on through that. Uh, just quickly, the preliminary arrangements bill, which, as I said, is uh, very close to being introduced and just highlighting streamlined processes for setting up CCOs, the requirements around water service delivery plans, initial steps towards economic regulation and the water care, the water care arrangements. The minister had been um, keen to try and get this all done by the middle of the calendar year, but it's a little... It's a crowded uh, legislative um, calendar at the moment. And unfortunately, in June, there's only one sitting week. So um, we're looking at July, but certainly no later than August for passing that bill. There will be a select committee process as well for that bill. Um, look, <clears throat> I can talk about this further, but the streamline arrangements around CCOs are basically... Uh, which will be set out in the bill. So councils will be able to put together joint committees that can consult on a proposal across multiple districts if a joint vehicle is something councils are interested in and basically making the consultation requirements a little, a little more streamlined. Um, also including that only two options need to be taken to consultation, which would be status quo and a preferred option that councils um, wish to follow. And I'll stress, this is only if councils are interested in establishing CCO. So I just want to be really clear that that is just an option councils can pursue. If councils wish to continue delivering water services as they are set up now and can demonstrate this is financially sustainable, that, that, is, that is absolutely fine. There won't be a problem with that, but we can, we can come to that later. Uh, <clears throat> water service delivery plans as I said, a reasonable, reasonably integral part of local water done well. And basically the plans are to provide councils with the ability either individually or jointly to demonstrate their intentions for the delivery of water services, to demonstrate how they'll be financed, uh, requirements to meet regulatory standards. Um, and a key element is the ring fencing of water services and revenue from other council activities. Um, when I say that, that can be as simple as a set of standalone accounts um, that set out water income, 
water expenditure and financing and capital investment and other and other investments. And that that um, that set of accounts would could appear uh, in any of your accountability mechanisms. It does not have to be a a specific bespoke um, document. But I think the rationale which the National Party campaigned on, which the government's been reasonably clear on, is to make sure that water revenue and water debt is being spent on water services and, and water investment. So that's the rationale for, for that focus. This is just a little bit more about what will be in plans. Um, and the, look, these slides will be available to you uh, afterwards as well. So I won't, I won't, I won't dwell on them. I think a couple of key things I'll point out, though the plans need to include all water services, including stormwater. Um, if councils wish to, in terms of the operational arrangements, for instance, not include stormwater, that's absolutely fine. The optionality is for councils and communities to decide upon. Um, the plans themselves are transitional documents, and I think that's important in the sense um, they will provide information that will be useful to the future regulator, which I can talk more about, um, but they are one-off documents and they're as much about setting a pathway forward for the future delivery of water services uh, as they are about demonstrating financial, financial sustainability. Once an economic regulation regime is in place, um, the importance of the plan will probably, uh, will probably fade over time as different mechanisms um, take the place of that initial document. As I was saying, the economic regulation regime will build off what will be in water service delivery plans. Um, the government's legislation that will be introduced uh, this month will set in place a, a foundational information disclosure regime. So that will give the regulator, the economic regulator, who will be the Commerce Commission, um, some ability to start collecting information from councils as they set up their regime. We're still working through the policy settings and the legislation for the economic regulatory regime, and that won't be introduced until that legislation won't be introduced until the end of this calendar year. But I think what I can say is it's intended to be a graduated regime. Uh, that the first step is information disclosure, and that is about the performance, uh, the performance of water services, um, fi financial elements, investment expenditure, uh, future borrowing and capex programs, um, as well as understanding um, pricing regimes for consumers. It will take time for a full economic regulatory regime to be in place. Um, but we are hoping that that can come into place over the next two or three years as, they, as, as we work through that regime. I can't say too much more about it uh, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, the policy decisions are still being made and the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment is the lead policy agency on economic regulation. But I'm happy to take questions and, and give as much information as I can. Thank you very much. Uh, Aaron first and then Pauline. Yeah, got a couple. So welcome to Christchurch. So question number one is chlorine. And what's the way forward on us removing chlorine? Will it be allowed? And I'm not sure how well you know Christchurch water history, but no one's ever got sick from our reticulated water. And that's from our medical officer of health. So we're in a strong position and we've mm. done tons of work. So chlorine's the first one mm -hmm. that people of Christchurch want to know about. What's our way forward? Yeah, so I'm not trying to evade the question. No, um, that's fine. The matter of chlorine in, in, in water supplies is a question for the water quality regulator, Tamat Arawa. Um, but two things. Minister Brown is particularly interested to make sure Tamat Arawa is focusing on its core regulatory functions that there's no overreach from the regulator and that the regulator is as its foremost, or as one of its foremost priorities, um, ensuring that it is not driving unnecessary cost or regulatory burden into the system. Um, well, like that. <laughs> so like that, that. that is the minister's focus and he is working very diligently to understand where the Water Services Act, which is Tamat Otherwise Act, 
um, where changes could be made that reduce regulatory burden and drive down costs in the system. I can't directly answer your question on water supply. That would be well exceeding my mandate and expertise, but... No, but you've let light through the door just then with your words of wisdom. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. And then um, the other one is around the way water is funded. Like, say we, as a council, stuck to just doing our water. Do we, or are we directed to um, rate for water separately and then ring fence that money to be spent on water separately? Is that the way forward? Is that what I'm seeing up there? Yeah, so the way, this will become clearer in the legislation, but the way I would describe it is the minimal test is will likely be to demonstrate an ability to have a standalone set of accounts that clearly set out water revenue, water expenditure, water borrowing, water, water investment. Um, the government is not going to tell councils how to collect revenue for water. Um, but it wouldn't be too far a leap to sort of look down the path a bit further and say, well, it's probably easier to ring fence, <laughs> ring fence finances if they are operationally and structurally separate. But that's a decision for councils to make. If the ring fencing requirements can be met, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. So if you're spending, say, pick a number, $300 million a year on water, then you need to collect that from water and put it into water. That's kind of what they're saying, isn't that, it? That would be the expectation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pauline? Yeah, and further to that, any debt that you take on for water needs to be applied yes. to water. But look, my question was actually very similar to Aaron's, but looking at the, three, the slide that um, touches on the three-stage legislation, um, on the far right-hand one there, you can see there... Um, second paragraph down, consider the water regulators empowering legislation to ensure the regulatory regime is efficient, effective, fit for purpose, and standards are proportionate to different types of drinking water suppliers, which is basically what you just um, told us. So is there a plan to review the, the regulators' um, powers and abilities and standards, and has that begun, and is there a timeline for that? <clears throat> Um, thank you for the question. I, I wouldn't describe it as a review. Um, what Minister has asked both us and the water regulator is come to me with your thinking on what's what's driving cost up in the system, where is it unreasonable, or, or, or where do we think it's disproportionate in terms of risk. Um, obviously, Minister is concerned that small suppliers do not have unnecessary regulatory burden put on them. Um, so we will give him that advice and he will start making some policy announcements June, June, July this year. And then that would feed into that piece of legislation, which will be introduced in November or December. Mm -hmm. And it would be subject to a full select committee process and full public consultation and submission. And I would envisage those aspects would be set out there. Yeah, I think we would applaud that someone having a look under the bonnet there, but but also it's directly tied to the risk appetite, isn't it? And it's difficult once the standards have been set to, to drop them down any further. So it will be interesting to see what falls out of that. Yeah, oh, look, I'm, I'm no expert, so maybe I should stop, but <laughs> um, the minister appointed a technical advisory group. And I think um, the members on that group are quite aware of uh, when, when public health requirements are a driver for regulatory compliance, you've got to be careful to avoid at all costs. And that, that's what, that's the mindset being taken to that. But look, we take public health very seriously. And obviously that's the Minister of Health and Director General who ultimately set those standards. And, and councillors will recall the, the willingness that Tamara Arawai uh, have to work with us uh, looking at our, our deep bore water, which we're, we're currently doing. In a, in a move to um, to prove that um, exactly what Councillor Kewan was saying is to what is the need for treatment. So that, that's in, in, the, in the realm of virus protection and stuff like that. So the, they've shown a huge willingness to work with us on that. Oh, that's good news. Thank, thank you. you. Yanni, please. Um, well, thank you. That's, that's, that's really positive news. Um, I think the problem is that we're spending now for something that might change, and that's kind of been the problem that we've had for about six, seven, eight years since the first 
requirement we were told to put it in temporarily. Mm. Um, I, I just was interested if there'd been any discussion about the city deal being tied into some changes because I think our estimate is going to cost 500 million to put chlorine in our water, worst case scenario, and I think maybe there's some a little bit less. Sorry, Yanni, how, how many million? 500 million oh, was one of the figures that we were given. Last week it was 50. Carry on. No, no. We're, so worst case scenario, if we have to meet all the standards to the level that the regu water regulator want us to, uh -huh. I think 500 million was the top figure. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's you know degrees within that. But I was just kind of interested in the city deal because if we have to wait another year, we're doing mm -hmm. a lot of work that's you know wasting money on stuff that for very low risk, where we've got other things that are much greater priority in terms of just the actual fixing the leaks or lead or whatever it might be. So I'm just trying to understand, like, is there any capacity within the government's thinking around city deals to look at bespoke um, uh, support for us as a city? Yeah, I'll, I'll be a little cautious because I've been on the periphery of discussions around city and regional deals and minister... Uh, still needs to take some policy decisions on that. And he has other colleagues um, who he's working with, now, Minister Bishop, for example. Um, having said that, I think the, the rationale behind a 12-month period for water service delivery plans, it, it's, no, it's no mandatory time limit in the sense, well, if councils wish to move faster than that or have different sets of discussions with the government, then councils are, are welcome to step into that space. Um, from the perspective of the city regional deal policy that the coalition government's working through at the moment, um, I think Minister Brown was very keen to make sure, given the uh, amount of time and money that was spent on three waters for not, not too much tangible achievement, if I can be polite to myself and former colleagues, uh, that at least a pathway was set up very clearly for councils as quickly as possible because he's acutely aware of the uncertainty that's been driven by the last by the last few years yeah. um but it would be for a council and the government if if you're suggesting well should we package up a a, a water proposal within a city and regional yeah. deal that would be for, for a council and the government to enter into that discussion so it's not it's not something i can so is there any because um, when I when I look at the water service plans, it seems to me like that's our infrastructure strategy as part of the LGP anyway. And then I and then I think to the fact that we had an earthquake and we never seem to really get any recognition of the impact of the earthquake on our water infrastructure, which is a lot different than just about any other council <coughs> in New Zealand of how mm. of how we manage it, um, including you know decisions that central government made around things like quality of repair to our network. Or what got repaired post quake so then you add on fluoride as well which is another big cost that we're faced with so yeah i'm just trying to understand within the water service plans the capacity to have recognition of the extraordinary circumstances that we we have in christchurch and to look at funding and um in a realistic way how will that be how can that be taken into account well um that, 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 that's not your department really is this is you're here to tell us how to the easiest way or the wee rules that might be sent in our direction on how to set up our CCO and stuff like that. That other mm. stuff you're talking about hasn't got anything to do with what we've been talking about. Oh, no, no. So what I was trying to understand, like, sorry, Pauline said that we, if we're fixing X amount of, of investing or doing so much in water, then the offsetting revenue needs to match to what we're doing. The problem for us is we had an earthquake. So we've got massive amounts of water stuff that wasn't repaired post-earthquake that's going to take a lot longer than just about any other council in New Zealand, right? And all I'm trying I, I to know, understand... I don't, I don't necessarily agree with you. We've got $17 million, billion dollars thrown at it, and it wasn't all spent on water. But uh, if all of our pipes have probably been fit, in my view, back to yes, but, where they were. But you know as well as I do, the patch repairs, brick, the old brick barrel patch repairs are breaking, and we're having to pay an extraordinary cost to fix some of that stuff. Regardless, I just didn't understand from the regulatory or the legal point of view or the accounting point of view, how the earthquake damage or the unique circumstance of Christchurch will be taken into account. So, Councillor, when we put together those water services plans, you are correct that um, we already have a lot of the information that's going to be required. We have our asset plans, we have our activity plans, 
we've got our strategic plans. Um, the, we have all that information there. I, th I think we'll have the opportunity to put detail on those plans. We just need mm. to wait for the legislation to come out as to how we're going to um, manage the network. In terms of the questions that are coming regarding chlorination, fluoridation, that sort of stuff, they really are tomato ROI questions. This is about or how we're setting up, or the Ministry of Health. This is the setting up of the structure yeah. going forward. Yeah. And um, Hamira is not going to be able to really contribute Correct. to that conversation. Okay, so I'm yeah. just conscious about time. We've got a few more questions. <clears throat> Melanie, please. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to know... Um, like they've repealed the Water Services Economic Sufficiency and Consumer Protection Act, mm. and they're going to bring in an economic regulation regime. To me, they sound similar. Do you know any? Do you have any idea what the differences will be? Yeah. So, the economic regulatory regime will be brought into legislation via the minister's third bill. So that bill will contain the the economic. Um, re regulation framework and elements. There'll be elements, um, preliminary elements being introduced in the bill he's about to introduce later this this month. Um, in terms of consumer protection, um, I think the government's very conscious. In many respects, we've got a consumer protection regime through existing legislation, existing mechanisms. So. Um, discussions about whether or not that regime would be introduced or replicated, um, but those are still yet to be had. Okay. I mean, why, why did they repeal that one that they've repealed? Is it just because it links so closely to this three waters framework they had before? Yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, um, it was a regime set up to regulate four and then 10 entities, and those, those 10 entities... Okay. don't exist so yeah, yeah. okay um so i've got a couple of other questions mm -hmm. um about mm -hmm. the regulatory backstop powers that they talk about um to ensure effective delivery blah blah do you know anything about what that might look like so when the government when the minister introduces his next bill the bill two in the middle there that will set out um arrangements where if if required he can assist councils who are perhaps not able to deliver a water service delivery plan or need some assistance or additional help to deliver a water service delivery plan. In terms of his third bill that comes in at the end of the year, um, the minister's still considering his position on that, but what, what I think what he said publicly is those powers would look very similar to what's in part 10 of the local, of the local government act. And um, reflect or emulate those provisions that are currently in, in existence. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Well, we about 10 minutes more. If, uh, um, Tyler. Um, uh, just, just for the, this is obviously publicly available now um, as a recording. I just wanted to put in layman's terms for the public around essentially what this looks like and what, are we sort of getting it right where this is deemed sort of status quo um, as per normal with a few amendments running through ccos in terms of this this whole regime here all three of these bills are going to come into one where it runs through the company in comparison to the centralization that the prior three waters um, bill had yeah um let me just trying to put it in the layman's terms yeah. for the public, really. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I sometimes I struggle <laughs> to do that. Yeah, sorry, apologies. But it's it's a character deficiency. Um, there will be no mandating from the government for structures, vehicles, or arrangements for the delivery of water services by councils. Um, councils and then communities will make those decisions. Um, what the government will do is have a, an economic regulatory regime to make sure investment's being made, um, there's uh, transparent arrangements for consumers in terms of prices, et cetera, um, and the government will ask councils to give, give to for, for, for um, acceptance water service delivery plans, which is the plan for delivering water um, in the community. If councils either now or in the future, want to look at different arrangements, then we'll make those vehicles um, available in legislation. 
And that's if councils feel they need or their communities are best served by achieving some more scale or different financing arrangements. But um, fun fundamentally, um, very different to, to the three waters approach. Great. Mm. And the next question is around the Māori voice. Where does Māori voice come into this? Well, I think too that's uh, probably another fundamental difference in the in the regime. So, uh, me and my team will make sure that uh, existing treaty settlements are not uh, impinged upon by anything we do when we're setting up new policy and legislation. Uh, but I think the the minister would describe this as um, the arrangements councils wish to have with mana whenua or or other iwi. Um, those are for councils and communities to determine um, their structures or approaches. So there'll be no mandated approach from the government in that regard. Cool, well, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gabe, have you got anything you would like to add or questions? Or yeah, come, so come right to come up to the mic. Sorry. Yanni's just getting you. Oh, no, we've got one. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Good. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, kia ora, kia ora. Thank you very much. And kia ora koutou. It's lovely to see some old faces. And it's a bit like Groundhog Day, but a little bit different. Um, from, from the Naito perspective, um, the Kaifakahari Justin went to the LGNZ meeting about a month ago and really have invited all councils to a coalition of the willing, which is absolutely voluntary. We're not interested in being in any CCOs. We don't want to own water. We just want to see better outcomes. And in actual fact, the change of government or the change of any political structure is not what we're interested in, really. It's about outcomes for the three waters. And that's what is the massive problem, getting worse, coming down the tubes at us. And if you think 30 years on from now, you know, what is the science around how well the aquifers will be, especially when you look at the recent media reports in places like Ohoka, uh, Kirwi, and we're really worried about that. And um, so we see Christchurch as in an enormous opportunity. I know all of the issues around Christchurch water supply and the great things about what was able to be done after the earthquake, but Christchurch is a leader in the South Island. And, you know, everybody's divvied off into their little fiefdoms and Waimakariri doesn't want to go with Christchurch and they're going up to Hurunui and Kaikoura and Selwyn, I'm not sure where you are there, but everybody's got to look at what is the bigger picture for the South Island and for our communities and I think that the leadership opportunity is here. Mm -hmm. We are happy to support in whatever way we can and we've already looking looking at the whole finances around it and how can we help councils that may not have that macro view to get information um, to actually get a better outcome for the South Island. So there's all the little, we, we're calling them the orphans. And I noticed when I met with some of DIA, they were calling them the orphans as well. It's the Mackenzies with 5,000 <clears> ratepayers, the, all of them across the South Island. We know Nobby Clark's not interested and he wants to go it alone but we know Queenstown is, and we've had a great response. So, um, you know, we will work with DIA, we'll work with any council that's interested and just try to get better outcomes. So probably my challenge for Christchurch City is to think about how you lead in the space, because you are definitely um, in a far more powerful position than anyone else. Okay, so I've got three, four. Um, Jake, please. Thank you. Um, it's actually probably a, a, a question on, on government policy, a bit, but spurred off what you were just saying about the orphans. I, I like that term. I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's the correct way to talk about No, it's orphans, not. But, um, but you know yeah, what I mean. I, I, it's, it highlights it perfectly. Um, does the government have a uh, position on amalgamation? Because I think part of what went wrong with the previous government's through water proposal was a dogmatic um, reluctance to uh, uh, allow for any amalgamation. Do you mean amalgamation of, of territorial of TAs, of, of, of territorial of authorities? Uh, not, not that I could communicate or not that I'm aware of. Right. Yep. Okay. I just yep. sort of see that as a potential fix for um, the orphan problem. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Victoria? 
Mm. Oh, kia ora, thank you, Mayor Phil. Kia ora, Gabe. Kia ora. You. Yes, you too. Um, can I get some clarity around uh, any particular minimum requirements for Naitahu? And what I'm angling towards is really your uh, comments in respect of any geographical boundaries, and particularly the Naitahu Takiwa. Yes, well, we are only interested in the Naitahu Takiwa, and from our perspective, it would make it much easier for everybody if the boundary was in any legislation, like it was last time, because it means you deal with just us, and we're interested, we're committed to this place, and we're committed to the South Island forever. So we are interested in how we can add value to what's already in existence. And we do have very good relationships with councils in the Takiwa. So, so will you be actively pursuing that to yes. ensure that the Naitahu Takiwa is contained within the legislation? Yes. I'm not hopeful of the outcome of that, but we, we definitely are pursuing that. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And just for purposes of clarity, and I'm not sure if this fits within the confines of what we're talking about today, but is there anything that you can tell us in respect of the Naitahu water claim and um, how and where that interacts with what's going on here? Completely separate from this, um, and we're in court in February for 10 weeks in 2025, so we're, we've ramped up activities on it. <laughs> yes, we're working very hard on it. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Aaron, and then Yanni, and that'll, and that'll do. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Um, I remember when the whole free waters thing first came up, one of your strongest concerns and one of your quite vocal positions was around um, marae across yes. the, your whole uh, takiwa and and the water supply surge, the whole lot around those. Is there any conversations around that? And is not one of the fixes to make sure all of them are potentially treated separately and we get to the outcome rather than go through a whole lot of other routes to get to the outcome, just go, well, that's a problem, let's fix that. And is there a way forward on that? We've done a lot more work on it since the last round. And still, the, of the 18 marae, nine are not on reticulated water supply, but it's got worse. Four have absolutely massive nitrate problems, including ones like Otako that aren't anywhere near dairy farms. Mm. So, the, and we're modelling currently um, how that's happened so we can understand the science behind it. Mm. Um, our, our thinking is we will invest ourselves, we will work with anyone to get all 18 connected, but geographically it's not that easy. So we recognise it's not going to be a fast fix, it's going to be a 30 to 50 year problem to solve. But is that something that we can help with? Them? Because that's one of the obvious problems and it has massive health outcomes. Yes. I think that should be tackled separately and whether, and us being the biggest, like you say, in the South Island, then can we be part of that solution somehow? And even if, no matter who's funding it, that we get to the outcome and then work out the vehicle to get there. I don't think it's separate because places like Kaikaurata to Port Levy, it's a holiday mecca for a lot of Christchurch people. Very difficult for how you get reticulated water there. Mm. Um, so usually in our communities, because they're in beautiful places near the sea, they attract a lot of people other than us. So I don't think it's separate. I think that we have to, the secret to our success in, in the Naitahu Takiwa is to work together yeah. and to be united and to find solutions together and use our research and our data gathering, because we've gathered data across the Takiwa. We've probably got better data than anybody at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so use it to help us all get better. Okay, thank you. And lastly, Yanni, please. Oh yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was, I was really interested in, um, again, the other thing happening in Canterbury is the Canterbury Water Management Strategy and the management's being reviewed. Yes. So. Are, are you involved in that? Obviously, we know central government played a key role in putting commissioners into ECAN, getting rid of the elected council. And now we've seen some pretty um, uh, scary signs with nitrates and consents being issued that probably shouldn't um, around water allocation. So I'm just trying to understand in terms of big picture, because I share the concern about nitrates, yeah. what work is being done? And again, this was something that council, I think, put in one of our submissions around the drinking water is that while we're getting a huge focus on local stuff, actually the impact of nitrates over time is actually really a lot worse in terms of risk than what we're currently facing. And, and that's where Tomata Arawai comes in 
as opposed to DIA, isn't it? Mm. Correct. Yeah. But are you but involved yes, in the we are. water management no, strategy review? and the Only in terms of Tuya Group at ECAN, but what we are doing is researching and, and using this, finding out the science and understanding, you know, where and why and how um, so that we can start thinking about solutions. But it's going to get to a point where people will need denitrification plants, we think. And already, like, we've got formerai that are carting in big, huge bladders of water. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime in this country. So it is very worrisome, and we all should be worried about it, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Yanni. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very, you. Thank you. And thank you very much for making the trouble coming down Wellington. <laughs> Not a problem. It's always good down here. Was it raining? Windy? What? It was raining, <laughs> Your Worship. It's great <laughs> to come to a crisp Christchurch morning. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we're allowed to see the sun sometimes. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much for making the effort, and you, you've clarified a number of things. So thank you. Looking forward to the next stage. Thank you. No, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Of the um, cause of the um, not a large number of uh, submissions to the LTP, but there were some very. Uh, very um, detailed submissions to the LTP on the Akira reuse scheme. Now, this scheme has been obviously going for some time. Um, previous council resolutions have approved it to go uh, to um, uh, discharge the land. So this is really an update for you. And to clarify some of the points that have been made by the submitters that you would have heard and in, in the, in the, the media campaign. Right, excellent. Thank, thank you for your time. Um, as, as Brent has indicated, we're here to talk today to the Akira Reclaimed Water Treatment and Reuse Scheme uh, and provide a project update. Um, so the pre-briefing uh, will provide a general update uh, on the Akira Wastewater Project. It will provide an update uh, on work that's been carried out on the inflow and infiltration reductions within Akira. Uh, and it'll provide a, a response to matters that have been highlighted by members of the public. So the Akaroa scheme, um, as you can see, it's uh, that with Akaroa to the south uh, is looking to provide treatment uh, on Old Coach Road at the site that, that is, has an existing consent. It's just above the township. Uh, and then treated wastewater will be distributed and irrigated on the uh, sites to the north of town. Uh, there will be reuse back into town uh, for irrigation to Jubilee Park as well as any other people that want to connect to the scheme and, and use that as beneficial reuse. Um, the flows, uh, the, well, the population obviously has uh, peaks over the Christmas break um, and we have quite a substantive uh, increase in the population with about 3,700 uh, people uh, going to Takara during that period uh, of around about a week or two weeks. Um, but the, the base population being around about 750 people. So to provide some, some background and context, uh, the treatment plant, um, it was due to close in the late 2020s uh, with a new treatment plant to be built on the north side of Akaroa at the old Coach Road site. And that's part of a resolution uh, that was made in 2010. Uh, council sought resource consents um, to facilitate an upgrade and a new harbour uh, <laughs> uh, consent in 2015. Um, at that time, uh, we were unsuccessful in, in gaining that consent, uh, and the reasons for that were the RMA requires the applicant to consider alternatives. Um, the application, it was opposed by Naitahu and local Runanga, uh, and the commissioners assessing the consent, they decided the council hadn't adequately considered alternative disposal methods, such as the land-based disposal method. So this kicked off uh, quite a lot of investigation uh, into alternative uh, land disposal options. Um, the council presented four different options for the community to be engaged with. 
uh, and they consult it through uh, community reference groups. Uh, so the, the four options were a harbour outfall scheme, such as had been requested but rejected uh, during the consenting process, an inner bays irrigation scheme, uh, which was ultimately accepted, uh, and two others, uh, the Goffs Bay Irrigation Scheme and the Pompeii Pillar Irrigation Scheme. Um, ultimately, the, the four options were put to the community for consul, uh, Council's uh, LGA decision in 2020. Uh, the outcome of this consultation was that the council resolved to uh, treat wastewater from the new Akaral wastewater treatment plant. It was to be discharged onto 35 and a half hectares of new plantings of native trees in Robinson's Bay, Takamatua and Hammond Point. Um, so following that, uh, we further investigation has identified that, that tech mature will no longer be needed um, in order to deliver the scheme. So we need to be mindful that the consents for the current discharge to harbour will expire in May 2030. Um, and there's previously been uh, extensions to the discharge to harbour cons consents. When the, uh, back in 2015, uh, there were a number of uh, consent applications applied for. Um, council was successful in obtaining some, uh, and, but not with the irrigation to land, uh, to discharge to harbour consent. So the, the, currently council holds a number of consents that will be uh, key to the delivery of this project. Um, they, they relate to construction consents and, and siting the treatment plant on the location proposed. Council has, uh, follow, following um, the resolution to, to discharge to land, uh, Council applied for a number of other consents uh, which will be required to deliver that project. Um, key to this is, is the discharge of treated wastewater onto the land via irrigation. Um, and in parallel, Council uh, has also sought uh, the, the consents from the Christchurch City Council uh, to carry out the, the works to um, construct the storage tanks and other physical works on the various sites. The current status um, of the consents, uh, ECAN uh, recently decided uh, or notified the council that they were going to notify publicly, publicly notify the resource consent. And we're expecting the, that to be uh, submissions to be opened up uh, shortly uh, for that process. Um, we, the infrastructure consents that are with Christchurch City, uh, we have yet to receive a decision as to whether they will be notified, but they are expected imminently. And that process is being carried out uh, with the help of an independent commissioner. There's been a number of um, comments raised in the media lately and I, I think it's helpful to uh, take the opportunity to to talk to those comments um, so one of the one of the comments is highlighted or indicated uh, that the Becker report says that the scheme isn't viable so council commissioned uh, Becker to carry out updates to the previous flow modeling that had been carried out to design the scheme um, Becker uh, carried out that and basically used the last three years of, of flow and rainfall data uh, to update their modelling. Um, while there is, it, it has highlighted that, that some of the flows uh, are higher, it, it doesn't show that the scheme is, viable, is not viable in our opinion. Um, there's been a, a comment that there will be more raw sewage going into the harbour. And I think this is, this is a key one for people to understand. Uh, at present, uh, the current reticulation heads to the Takapaniki site. Uh, as a result of this uh, scheme, there will be upgrades to the pump stations and the infrastructure, which will see uh, wastewater overflows to harbour from raw wastewater reticulation uh, dropping 
from about five times per year, as it currently is, uh, down to around once every five years, according to our modeling. There's another comment, uh, there, there will be regular treated water discharges. Um, now our work with uh, Becca, it does inform us about the frequency of when treated water discharges occur, noting that the treated water will be significantly uh, higher quality than what is currently discharged to the harbour. Um, but it's indicating that the, the infrastructure as proposed will have capacity to uh, cope with, well, there will only be a release of highly treated water once every two and a half to five years. Um, questions about the inflow and infiltration, uh, meaning that the scheme isn't viable and a request for council to fix the pipes first. So over the last number of years, uh, since 2018, there's been a significant amount of work undertaken to address, identify and address uh, the potential or the, the inflow and infiltration issues uh, that are pre present over in Akira. Um At present, we believe that the inflow and infiltration sits at around about 24%, uh, which compares against Christchurch cities and flow and infiltration of 23% over the same period. Uh, we believe that a lot of the inflow and infiltration is now coming from the private network uh, between uh, the road boundary and people's gully traps. We're looking at doing uh, private property inspections to uh, resolve some of those issues. Um, so some of the things that we've utilised is distributed temperature sensing where we've uh, actually, during rainfall events, looked to find uh, real data of where leaks are happening. Um, and we've gone and targeted those areas with repairs and replacement of pipes. Uh, we've also repaired manholes, uh, lifted surrounds around pump stations um, and, and other areas where we have identified uh, inflow. Uh, this graph is basically putting on the table the, the I and I estimates that we've used in the development and, and application. Um, there's a number of times I think that there's been highlighted that there has been high I and I in the past, and with reference to some months where there is significant rainfall events, I and I does occur. Um, but when we look at it over the period uh, that we've had good flow monitoring at the, at the treatment plant, uh, we believe that the average is around about 24% across that period. Um, I think it's important to note that we've been working closely with the uh, Anuka Runanga uh, through this process. Um, and one outcome uh, of both uh, working with them and the working parties uh, has been the inclusion of a wetland to be located opposite the new treatment plant. Um, the EWI's view is, is that by passing the any wastewater, uh, treated wastewater, uh, that needs to be discharged to the harbour, uh, that we will uh, restore some of the Māori to the water before it enters the harbour. Sorry, could you just say that sentence, <clears throat> that little bit again, please? I just... Uh, by passing some of the... We, should, should the storage tanks be uh, become full during a, a long wet winter, um, if we do need to have a release of treated wastewater to the harbour, rather than irrigating it on the land, if we pass it through the wetland, uh, then the iwi's view is that, that uh, some of the Māori or the life force will be restored to the wastewater uh, before it's discharged to the harbour. Yes, okay. Petra, I can understand. Yeah. Yeah, so why aren't we just building more ponds and just letting it do what this is? <laughs> is Carrie, is actually the, the very quick answer, because it's, it's a fair question, is one, the water doesn't stay in this wetland long. When we're releasing water at this one in five year event, it's going to go through pretty quick. Now, Anuka are pragmatic people. They know we can't uh, 
store water forever in vast volumes because it's just not possible from an engineering perspective. So they have said, hey, we appreciate that from time to time. A release will be inevitable. Uh, Cyclone Bowler events of the 70s, some of those were huge, huge winters of rain. So they know that sooner or later we're going to have to let water go. And we've worked with them to come up with a solution to try and mitigate that release. But it's not accepted as a day-to-day -day thing that's just fine. It's trying to make the best of a bad situation. Okay. But at the same time, they're not insisting that we store everything because they know that's just not possible. We can't hold back the tide. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yep. So, sorry, just one. I'm, I'm buttoning there. I shouldn't do this. Um, that, that's on a good day, if you haven't got any overflows, that will be dry. We know, most of the time it'll be dry. It's only when you're in strife it'll have water in it. That's right. We, we're only putting enough water in it to keep the plants in it alive. So okay, thank you. Sorry. It goes in, evaporates yeah. out. That's it. Carry on. I'll shut it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, Doesn't work. The, so the plan plan from here, I mean, we, we do have a, a deadline time frame that we're working backwards, backwards from being May 2030. Uh, when the existing discharge consents lapse to harbour. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we, we are looking at planting 50,000 trees this winter. Um, we're looking at undertaking uh, track and fence upgrades and maintenance uh, to the land, man uh, land disposal areas uh, that council own. Um, we are looking at awarding a contract to undertake the detailed design based on the, the process as developed and the process that we've applied for consent for. Uh, next year, we will uh, continue with more tree planting, more of the Kanuka predominantly on the irrigation sites. We'll be looking at completing detailed design and tendering um, should we obtain, be successful in obtaining uh, the resource consents required to carry out the process. Um, 2026 and 2027 would look to be undertaking construction uh, with commissioning in 2028. Um, that, that's where the project is currently set at. Uh, sub, uh, this is all subject, of course, to obtaining the resource consents required. Okay, Aaron, please. Yeah, so I've got um, two, and you did kind of cover off the first one around the INI. and I. Uh, and, uh, I, I recall in Redwood 20 years ago, we did gully trap inspections, and then you were forced to lift your gully trap uh, if it was too low, which made sense. The guy explained it to me on the day. It was an old house. We fixed it up. Are we going to do that? So we'll do the inspections and then you just, you are required to lift it. Exactly the plan. Yeah. Okay, cool. So is that program underway already? Uh, we did a few a while ago when we tried to hit the, um, the worst ones, but now we're just looking at going back and doing a whole catchment. Right, because we get to make that really clear to the local community, and I'm sure Tyrone's happy to help with that. Um, and then the other one is uh, something that was raised by the local fire brigade was the lack of uh, access to water. And down in a harbour, uh, they need it at the top of the hill, and we're going to put a whole lot of water at the top of the hill, but we're going to put it in closed lid tanks. Do, do we have other options to either um, go for uh, small dams, storage, or whatever, or big tanks that the lids come off. Um, can we do that so the fire brigade can put out big fires? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're probably thinking like helicopter monsoon yep. bucket type things. <clears throat> That's what they were We've, We had to. a good good question from the community board on that too. So we'll probably talk to Fens and see what, what would work for them. And it might be something we can just uh, open a valve and fill up as they need it. And normally things are covered and enclosed just so that the, the neighbours don't have to worry about any images or odour, any any possible thing from sort of stagnant water. But, but you reckon we can come up with a design that will facilitate that? That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tyler. Kia ora, guys. Uh, I've got a couple. Um, the first one is that $4 million you worked on, was that um, working within the scheme or catchment that was supposed to be we're supposed to be building that, yep. that project. Okay. The next one is the 2020 reading um, on slide 14. It reads as 3%. Um, can you tell me why that that year in comparison to the other years is so low? Yeah. Um, that was a drought. So 
<clears throat> I, I don't think it rained pretty much from October to June that year. It was extremely dry. Uh, so we, we were doing the repair work at the time. And what it's really indicating is those years afterwards, we've got the three peaks. Mm. Those peaks are all coming in when we're seeing heavy rain. It's not, it's indicative that it's not broken pipes under the ground. That's our current problem. It's water coming in down those gully traps and drains. So gotcha. that, that's why we target in that way. Uh, that said, before that, we did have a lot of low lying pipes in the sort of below the high tide level, which we suspect were leaky and we've been in and hit all of those. So that's that's a big part of why we want to hit gully traps next because the water's not coming in when it's dry, it's, it's when it rains. It's good to know. And the last question is actually around that same graph with those readings that are hitting over 60%. Um, we've got 2017, 2022, and 2023. Is there a collaboration of mitigants that you're doing in, in regards to trying to offset that I and I? Yeah, so that that's sort of the... Though, those two weekends, both in July's last winter and the winter before, I think we had 160 mil of rain in two days out in Akira. So at that point, bets are somewhat off um, when you got that much water on the ground a, a gully traps around isn't going to do anything though. you've got water coming in from all over town so those type of events we can't do too much for short of sealing every gully trap in town and that that wouldn't necessarily be a good outcome so we're reliant at that point on lots of storage and uh, having a fairly robust irrigation plan so we can bring that water down without an adverse effect but yeah, at some point, um, those types of rainfalls do really There will be really flow and things of the sort. Okay. And in light of the things that are coming, obviously, with climate change and things like that, does that come into play when we're looking at things like this, or do you, do you just use past measurements in, in regards to this? No. So what, what we did was we, <clears throat> when we did the modelling, we took the last 50 years of rainfall and applied that to the model to see what happened in different events. And then to account for climate change, we multiplied up all of those rainfall events right. by 15 to 20%, just to get that higher intensity rainfall that Lero and others are predicting. It's good to know. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just have a quick question. Can you just explain to me a wee bit more about when you said gully traps and high tide? It, 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 gully traps are only around a house, or are you saying the high tide was getting into the system? Uh, sorry, yeah, was getting into the system through yep. somewhere else. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, uh, two separate two separate things, so probably quite close together. Uh, when I gully traps set aside, when I said high tide, I was talking about the broken pipes we've been replacing. So a lot of those pipes are below the high tide line. Down on the flats in Akara, the pipes are yeah. below high tide, not yeah. not the gully traps. It, so what, what you're saying is that the, the, the high tide comes up the trench, so to speak, and leaks into the pipes. Well, the, if you can imagine the spring line in the in the trench where the pipes were laid 80 years ago, quite a quite a lot of that's below high tide level. So, yeah, we've got we got buried pipes that will be below the high tide. Oh, that's why yeah, but yeah, as, as you will know, I've laid pipes five meters below the water table, so mm. I know I know what that is. But and sometimes if you're in a in a in a clay area, you can have you can be three meters below. A, a creek and water won't go in there because it, it, what I'm saying is, is the seawater actually infiltrating up the trenches on the outside and then leaking into the pipes? Is that? Uh, we, we, we wouldn't know exactly where. We just know it's below okay. the spring line. Now, just while I've got the talking stick, when you say it, at the moment it leaks into Children's Bay, is that from that pumping station by the reserve? Now, the worst one is, is two. The one by the reserve is the last one to overflow. It's the one by the fire station, which overflows more frequently. Oh, that, the fire station one's the one, is it? That's, that's is that because it can't pump it fast enough to the treatment station? Yeah. So okay. we'll, we'll, the, the effect of the scheme will be to double the capacity of that station. So, so the, the reserve pumps to the fire station, the fire station pumps to the... Yeah. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so um, daisy chain. All right. Yeah. Um, e yep. Oh, oh, lastly, there's no pond in, in Robinson's Bay now because it is people are getting a bit upset about. So that's why we're going to build tanks. That's right. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Pauline. 
I didn't realise that. They're taking away the, the con from Robinson's Day. Um, the, uh, just, this is a question for the organisation, actually. If there's identified problems on people's private property, do we can we set up an ability that we can lend them the repair money and they pay it off through their rates? Could we just have a look at that? Because it just might overcome some barriers. Um, and the other question that came up um, through the submissions is devotionals. Can you talk about devotionals? It's now going to be linked in with this. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't. Did we have to do that? No, we don't have any slides. Uh, we should have, should have had a good slide for this. We're, we're looking at an option to uh, combine devotional wastewater treatment at the new Akaro plant. Yeah. And this was triggered um, by events of last July when we had that 160 mil of rain in 48 hours that loosened up the hillside above the devotional treatment plant and we had landslides into the plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, when things dried out and it was safe to go back, we got some geotech engineers and they found major instability issues in the slope. So that's going to cost millions to remediate, cut back, batter, stabilise. Mm. The plant's halfway through its useful life. So we've been doing some cost work. At, is it worth centralising? And yeah, it stacks up to... So you pump it from there round to the... That's right. There to uh, Akara, which then gives you an opportunity in future if you want to bring in Takamatu or other other areas you could, then we'd have to pipe water back from Robinson's Bay to devotional irrigation up. In oh, it's still going to irrigate there. Yeah, so we still need that that capacity to irrigate. Well, um, it's again, it's, it, so it's a lot of piping, but it does remove treatment plant from the system, which has a lot of benefits to us. Uh, it also means if people want to put their hands up and take that treated water for cut and carry or horticultural use, whatever, it opens up more opportunities. Okay, thank you. So, sorry, what you're saying, you're going to pump untreated sewerage from the Boshals to Akaroa, past Robinson's Bay, yep. treat it, and then take it back to Robinson's Bay. This stuff will be giddy. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, okay, right. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, Yanni, please. Thank you. Um, what's the total cost of the project, and what's the cost of the ponds? <laughs> Uh, 93 million is the total budget. Um, ponds, you mean ponds or the tanks? Oceans, oh, it? the one no. that you no. had for the cultural values. Uh, the yeah, the, the wetland. These ones, the wetland, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sort uh, of three or four hundred thousand dollars. Right. Okay. Um, so it's about 132,000 per property or per, per person we're going to spend on the scheme. If, if we have we thought about what we could do at an individual site? Because that seems a huge amount of money. You know, like we talked about, I don't know, rainwater, grey water. It's a lot. You know, is there, are there more localised solutions that we can look at where we would actually get a better investment? Well, ultimately, you've got 1,200 properties in a very small space. We can't put 60 tanks in. We can't treat on site. We've, we've got the sewage It'd be great if people use less water. It'd be great if they all had grey water recycling, that sort of thing. But ultimately, we're going to have a volume of water we've got to, got to treat. And septic tanks or other on-site solutions don't work when we've got that density of housing. So sooner or later, we, we need a centralised treatment plant. And more importantly, somewhere to send the water once we've treated it. Right. Um... I know, I mean, obviously there's cultural issues with discharging into the harbour. I totally mm -hmm. understand that. Is, is, is there any option that we've talked about with the local Runanga where given the costs are increasing to such an extent that we would get a better outcome if we went further out in the harbour? Like, is there, like, like we do it with, you know, over in New Brighton, we, South Brighton, we, we go out to the harbour. It, it would have been a great question for Gabe. Yeah, well, I was hoping said, they could get to stay. Yeah. Okay, th thank you. There's still a few more questions. Sorry, and I probably have another one too. Um, I'm sorry, I can answer that being part of the hearings panel, and it wasn't acceptable to Naitahu to extend the pipe out. To extend it out, we have to go out the heads and right round as far as is it Stony Bay around the other side, so it's in the actual open ocean. So it, it's unacceptable to extend it. Tyrone. Kilda. Um, 
so actually the first thing I want to know, I just want some clarification on on the back of the mayor's question around overflows at Children's Bay, because in the slide, slide 11, it says, it's a bit <laughs> ambiguous because you said these overflows of treated wastewater currently occur about five times a year. Do you mean that's into Children's Bay or is that at the, at the, near the fire station because they're quite separate locations? Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a sweep in Children's Bay being fire station to the, the next one round, so that's that's probably wrong. So so is it happening five times a year at the fire station or or five times a year at Children's Bay or five times a year between them? Between them. Right. But it will overflow at the fire station first? Normally, yeah. Right, okay. So what's the... Um, so given everything that we've learned today, how big are the storage tanks in Robinson's Bay going to be? We've got about 24,000 cubic metres planned for Robinson's Bay, and then we've got another 3,000 around the treatment plant in the, the wetland and the raw sewage tank there. So all up about 27,800. Um, okay. And because you'll know that, that some of the points put by the Friends of Banks Peninsula would be that there would be, based on the modelling, 40,000 litres required. And I know you've kind of explained through there. So, so how, do we, how do we account for that difference in their modelling versus, versus what we're oh, currently... I, I can't speak to what they came up with. Yeah. I, okay. I, I don't know how they got their answers. It doesn't concur with Becker's reports. I can't talk to that. Okay, no worries. Tyrone, just to give you an idea, just try to give you an idea. You know those um, white things you see people cart around on their trailers that hold water? Yeah. They're a cubic metre, right? Right, yeah, yeah. 27,800 of them. Yeah. That's how big it's going to be. It's, it's not a, it's individual, but that's how big it's going to be. That's quite large, your worship, <laughs> isn't it? Kira. Um, <laughs> so just, just regarding the I and I, so, and that's slide 14. So, I see you've got an average here. I guess my question is, does it, the average really matter? Like, isn't the, the important part, like, at the peak levels, like, say, in 2023? Like, you know, who cares Who cares that, that it was 3% in, in 2020? I mean, it's never going to sort of affect the, the sort of the peak capacity and only really matters when when there are kind of like peak flows so so why I'm just I guess I'm, I haven't quite got my head around what this slide's trying to t tell me when you're when you're trying to say the average INI is 24 percent like why does that matter there's, there's a few reasons for that one storage is all about the winter average it's not about the one-off peak so but like, isn't you know like when, it, when we're talking an overflow into the harbour we only really care about when it exceeds capacity, right? Like we don't really care about what the long-term average is. We only care about when the I and I basically like tips things over the edge. So you can average it out all you like, but it's like when we're getting mega rain, you're just getting mega overflows. So that's kind of like how I would imagine it. No, have I just got that oh, wrong? Uh, I'm unclear what your question is. Yeah. Um, the, the, the purpose of worrying about I and I for the scheme is when we get you know three or four months of steady inflows through I and I, that slowly fills up our storage. And it's enough to push our storage over the limit and we'd have to release treated water to the harbour. So getting on top of the day in, day outflows is what really matters to us, not so much the peaks. So one day at 70%, yeah, that's bad. But in terms of storage and being able to hold back that treated wastewater, it's um, you know fifty days at ten percent inflows that really kills us. So yes, the average is important in terms of storage. In terms of uh, the network overflowing, absolutely, you're worried about the peaks. And yeah, because I'm I mean I'm I'm worried about the network overflows. That's the that's the thing yeah. that I'm really concerned about. <clears throat> so so separate the two and. One of our challenges is those days where it overflows, we're getting you know, 100 millimetres of rain plus in one day. So it's becoming difficult to, to hold those flows back and stopping them getting in the network when they're over top in people's gully traps. <clears throat> so we've still got to hit them. It's still important. Okay. And, but, 
Thanks, Tyrone. I'll just. Are you done? Can I just have one more, please? Yeah, Mr. Okay. Is that all right? Like, I don't mind passing the the, the baton, but I'm That's just. That's fine. Just you know, yeah, no, I've still got thing. Uh, three after you. Um, just in terms of the, and again, maximums and minimums and stuff like the base population of Akaroa, like the seven, the number seven fifty. Like, is that? I mean, I couldn't imagine there'd, there'd ever be as few as 750 people using facilities in Akaroa at any given time, because there's always people passing through. There are people that are, you know, not permanent residents. You know, it's so there's a, people who live there semi-permanently. So I'm just kind of interested in like what, what, how we model that number. Yeah, um, getting the population for Akaroa is ridiculously difficult. Because, as you say, people come, they go, you know, census is a Tuesday night in March. So it's, it's a really cagey measure. Um, what we ended up doing to try and get a better handle, especially around those holiday peaks, um, you know, like November through to February when it all changes, is we measure um, the amount of load in the wastewater going to the treatment plant. So we know from literature and tests in Christchurch and other cities, the average person makes about 74 gram of load per day on average. Uh, so we measured how much load goes into the treatment plant to try and come up with a better prediction. Um, we tried all sorts of methods. That was about the best one we've been able to come up with. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Oh, that's, that's helpful, thank you. Righto. Um, we're, we're boring into our morning tea, but this is very important. And so we won't have a break and we'll just keep on going because we're out of here at 12. Uh, Victoria? Thank you. Can I take you back to the uh, devotionals piece of work that you're looking at at the moment? Mm -hmm. What is the timeline for you to be expecting to complete that piece of work in terms of the options that are available for you? It's the first question. Then the second part is, in the event that you do uh, resolve to... Uh, wrap that into the uh, works that are going on in Akaroa, is that something that has to happen at the same time or is it, can it be a separate program of work that can be added to at a later date, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that does. Uh, so first question, we've got a recommendation going to ELT at the moment. So uh, something should come through the system in the next week or two to you guys. We'll see how that goes. Uh, in terms of time, and we'd want to do it sooner rather than later because we do have this big land instability problem. We don't want to lose that plant overnight in a major landslide because that would be fairly calamitous. So we want to try and get it happening as quick as we can. Um, at the moment, it's a separate stream of work. We may combine it with Akara. We may keep it separate. We're looking at how do we get it to happen as quick as possible. Can I have a supplementary to that, please? And that is... Um... Is it safe to assume that there'll be cost efficiencies to do it all at once rather than as an add-on piece of work later? Yeah. Yes. And it just, I'm, I'm sorry, I was just looking at something else. Did you, uh, uh, sorry, the devotional add-on is about 30 mil. Is that, that what it was anyway, 15, wasn't it? Isn't it? One, three. Oh, 20. Doesn't matter. Can we come back to you on that It's one? a number of mils. Yeah. Okay. Um, Aaron and then Mel. Can I, can I just check, please, for the organisation? Oh, Will we have this information for the long-term plan final decisions? Uh, uh, is the devotionals, is there a line in the budget? Yes, there is. That? Thank funded. you. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, Aaron's not here. That's good. Melanie. Uh, my question was just about um, Takamatua, because um, it said it was decided that land wasn't needed, but... Um, I was wondering why that was decided and if we did have it, would it stop any overflows? Uh, it would, would it have reduced overflows? It might have stopped one or, or one or two releases of treated water. It wouldn't have stopped them all. So it might have made a few percent of difference, but not, not a great deal. The site's also uh, very low line and prone to flooding in winter. So, because it's so wet, we wouldn't be able to irrigate it in peak winter anyway, and that's when we really need it. So, it was kind of, didn't add much to the scheme, uh, introduced a lot of complexity and a lot of cost, which just didn't justify it being included. Okay. And, and angst for locals who live there. So. Th thank you. And the very last one from me, and gentlemen, I'll let you go. <laughs> um, 
I've always been mad keen, as you know, I've dug a few trenches in my life. And if we're running trenches all the way from um, Akaroa, up from the top of the hill to the Boshals and back, and up, it is costing us absolutely no, not a lot more if the trench is dug to put a second pipe in the trench to cart water from Akaroa because we're spending over a million dollars a year doing that Akaroa to Devotions. Are we looking at putting, a, say, a 200 mil pipe in the same trench to do that so we've got water there without having to truck it? Uh, well, the main, the main way to get around the trucking is we're fixing up the Devotional water treatment plant so that it can treat the water that comes into it and doesn't need supplementary from Akaroa every other day. So that's job number one. Do we throw an extra pipe in the trench? We're working through the business case for that one. Okay, thank you. We're not thank sure. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Run away before we ask you more questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Right, where are we at? We have got all of no minutes. So, um, is Helen, did I see her stick her head in a minute ago? Uh, I think. <laughs> We'll carry on rewardless. We're spot on time, Helen. I'll be honest with you, Vic. It's probably um, the way more than the things that get you up the other night than this one. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Helen. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Phil. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I did expect that there would be have been a decision by today in relation to the Local Government New Zealand membership because there is a development component of that membership which... Um, may be relevant to your policy. So just just uh, bearing that in mind. Um, so you will recall during the long-term plan workshops, we did have a discussion about professional development and uh, you asked me to come back with some options using the same budget envelope for how the professional development budget could be spent. So... I sent through in advance a summary of what your current policy says. It was adopted and refreshed last in 2019, so that's five years ago. Um, and it's very much a self-directed training budget with an allocation. So provided you have identified a course or a conference uh, for training, um, there's a form you fill out, Mabel helps you, and it gets signed off and, and it happens. But there's no, there's no other input into relation to spending that. So it's treated as an allowance under our current policy. And it's just time to have a discussion, see whether you want any changes and what that might look like. So, so that's very much here. We're looking at for next year, um, $78,585, that is the envelope. Um, we've put together a couple of options but there, there may well be other options for you to discuss as well. And I will touch on the Arcona provision as well um, because it's not in your papers. So one of the things you could do differently within that envelope is have retain an elected member self-directed component, but also include a group component. There is currently no budget for group provided work. So when for example, your sessions with Stephen Finlay or the chairperson sessions, that's effectively unbudgeted spend. And we have to manage that within other budgets. But there's nothing identified to prioritise group training within the current policy. Um, and you may see that as something that's to look at. So that's option one. How, how you carve up that envelope is for discussion. Option two is the same, but including perhaps a biddable component. I do know that there are some other um, councils who look at that. So say a third of their budget is people can put in and, and, and bid for and the mayor or the chief executive look at um, who may be the most deserving case. So that's one option. And that may be, for example, for conference, 
um, if you still uh, plan to attend local government New Zealand conferences, um, how many people should go, who should they be, and so on, who will get the best benefit out of that. Um, obviously, option three is no change at all. So do we just put together a couple of ways that may look like for next year, that if you were to reduce the sort of individual allocation, um, how much money there may be left for other options within that envelope. Now, um, you'll see that $4,000 times each of you is not the full component. That is because there is the additional money to allow for the chair people to ask for extra training to support that role. So that is why if you times that there is the differential between the two because that is um, allowable under your current policy. So to say, if you were to reduce the um, individual counselor um, entitlement, if you like, down to $3,000 each, that would give 28,000, no, 27,500 for other things. And just as a bit of rule of thumb for group training, you're probably looking somewhere between four and a half thousand and seven thousand dollars a day, depending on the training. So that would, if all of that 27,000 um, were to go to group sessions, that could be, um, well, it, it could be several days of group sessions for, for you all. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. I will be led by you on how you would like this conversation to go. Um, it was a bit mixed last time we, we touched base on this. So I'd, I'd be really grateful if, if you felt that uh, you could give me some guidance so that I can bring you back a, a paper at a, at a future date. Uh, sorry, uh, Celeste. Um, thank you. I think it's great to see. As you know, I've asked lots of questions about this, so it's good to actually have the opportunity to discuss it. Um, and I just have a couple of questions to start with. Um, with. I do think it's worth looking at the current model in terms of the extra biddable, the 2000 for committee chairs because of the way that we've changed the organisational sort of structures, um, because I think that's quite restrictive now. Um, and if we want councillors to be able to move into those roles um, and sort of take up, you know, being able to kind of move into the chair role, I think it's a shame that people coming through can't access that. So I would be open to looking at that in regards to maybe just making that a bit of a pot. Um, so if somebody is a portfolio holder or wishes to upskill in some way, perhaps looking to become a committee chair, there might be the deputy, I don't know, maybe not being too restrictive, but you know, we have all sorts of uh, different types of responsibilities across this, um, across the chambers. So I think it needs to be quite broad, would be my um, feedback around that one. And then my other question is around the induction part of council. Is that considered group training or is that a separate? bit of work like the council uh, pay for that for for the uh induction planned after the last election there was no budget allocated um but uh there there was group training provided as as you will call um there is for the next financial year after 24 25 an increase to allow for additional training for the election year so this budget is is for next year um, and there, there would be sufficient money in that year to arrange for group tra training, similar or different, depending on your feedback to what we arranged after the last election. Okay, and so I guess my bit of feedback around that would be, I my preference would be to keep the individual allocation the same, keep the 10,000 separate for more of a contestable pot for upskilling um, based upon some criteria that we can agree on, and then a separate focus on induction training which I think the organization should be looking at as as part of our kind of core BAU rather than a self-directed thing. Victoria. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah I'm, I'm with Celeste and reiterating the comments that each of us are at different 
stages and have different requirements in terms of our professional development. Um, and noting that comment about, or the provision for the chairs, I think it's equally important for yeah. the deputy chairs because they are the ones who need the professional development to get to the chair. And often those who are in a chair capacity already have the skills to be a chair. So I'd like to see a bit of change around that. Am I correct that, I am getting to a question. Am I correct that at the moment we do it on an annual basis as opposed to a trainee training basis? That, that's correct because the, currently the uh, this part of the policy is contained within the overall allowance and expenses policy, which runs on the remuneration authority year, which is first of July to thirty June. Yeah. So I, that that is how it's currently set up. I'd really like to see a review of that policy because I think that there is merit in a triennium approach as opposed to a yearly approach and I say that on the basis that each uh, member's uh, requirements are quite different and it could be beneficial to be able to roll that in together that's that's what I'm thinking about that um, recently I put in a request to attend something and I'm just about to quote your email back to you I put in a request to attend a woman in business forum that had a fee of $100 for me to attend. And the policy provides for conferences, courses and training programs and forum doesn't fit within this category. I think that's bollocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to have a closer look at what we can and can't attend. And again, um, forums are equally as important for us for a number of reasons and to be precluded from attending that. I was just like, I was like, really? It made just no sense to me. So I, I think we are very much at a point where we need to be reviewing our policy. So not, it never came in front of me. So I was of the understanding that the sessions with Stephen um, last year, this whenever they were, uh, were being taken and drawn from our individual budgets, and that's how they were being paid for, and it was depleting our own balance that that's what i had been told I, I, so i, I was can... really confused now to get this and hear otherwise from you today but it occurs to me that we really need to have a closer look at this policy yeah. i i can confirm there was no budget for any training on that in that year so the group training was managed otherwise but there was no individual budgets for any elected members that year okay Okie dokie. It was it was through the COVID um, reductions. Mm -hmm. So my closing comments, I would like to see a review of the policy, please, because I think it needs some work. Thank you, Tyler. Hi. Uh, as you know, I'm I love professional development, um, and for me, um, I've got a couple of questions, and the first one is around actually not just us as elected members, but community board members. I feel like it'll be really beneficial for community board members, not just chairs and deputies, to be trained up in good governance. That's just my thoughts. How much money can, do you think we've got lying around? Oh, if you've seen the newspapers, I, think, I mean, we're relitigating things all the time. I think it's really good that we sort of reflect that upon the community board members too. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right, 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 right. right, right, right. Come on. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I just um, this may not work under our elected members' allowances, but I'd love some advice around that. The second one is, um, I would also like to see. This is going a little bit outside again. Um, a list of potential professional development courses or anything we can do because I got given the RMA commissioners course through Ngaitahu and um, they actually paid that for me. Um, just in terms of our upskilling around good governance, it'd be really good if we got given options, if we wanted to do that. And that would actually help staff knowing what's gonna be ahead, things like that. You may not know all the time. Um, and I'm quite happy with the individual allowance we've got now. Um, I felt like that the group ones weren't as beneficial, to be honest, um, because everyone's at different levels. If we're at the same level and if we, all of us are re-elected, yes, that would be beneficial. But because of the new blood that came in, we had seven councillors that were on completely different levels of governance, which actually made me think that actually individ individual um, levels are probably more beneficial to us in this term. 
not meaning that it might not be the same next term, if that sort of makes it clear. Um, thank you, Tyler. If, if perhaps if I start with just addressing the community board point, I, I do really want to clarify the community boards have their own budgets for training across all the boards. That's nearly $28,000. Mm. Is that for each one? <coughs> Excuse me? Is that for each one? No, oh, that's sorry. between all of them. Okay. It's around, but there's a bit of a, over, um, over and unders. It's around 5,000 per board, not quite. Yeah. The actual spend across all of the boards this year to date of that 28,000 is 3,135. Three boards have spent nothing. Mm. That's, there's, I imagine, I haven't looked at what was spent. So three boards have spent nothing. One board spent $61 and the other two looks like they sent one person each on a conference. It's up to each board hmm. to determine how they spend their training budgets. So that's a conversation for each community board to have with their governance managers. Um, they're not subject to this policy. Okay. They have their own budget. So how do they including us, how do we know about the professional development budget? Uh, well, Was it within um, the induction papers or just, um, just asking? That's, I'm providing this for you now, but that's a question at any time. Yeah. Um, it should have been something, and I'm you know, the community board's um, management aren't here to be able to answer some of those questions, but um, it is a matter for each board. Okay. Um, and they did arrange an overall group session right at the beginning, but I can't answer whether that level of detail was included. Yeah. So, so that that just to make that clear about the community boards cool. um, and the provision on that. And the secondly, in terms of what's coming up, at, at the moment, apart from the administration from Mabel, there is actually, there is no allocated staff resource mm. to support member development. That is that is the current status quo. Um, there would probably need to be a little bit more staff resource than just uh, Mabel administering the paperwork if mm. there was to be more information on what courses are out there available. Um, in terms of what Akona provides for you, so you perhaps coincidentally may have all received an email today about that from Local Government New Zealand. Um, that I think is about the third one. I think that's been sent directly to all members. Um, and I did include it in an elected member update as well a few weeks ago. So that is available to all the elected members you sign in. There's a tool you can use to assess yourself what needs you may have in the training area. And they have um, a number of online courses that you can um, um, interact with. They also do have hours, unfortunately, a number of them seem to clash with our long-term plan meetings, but they do have what they call the ARCOR hour. The next one's on engaging with the media, it clashes with a long-term plan meeting for you. Um, and um, But they have those from time to time as well. Cool. Helen, I think the big one that some of us will probably be eyeing up is the IOD course, which obviously falls outside of our current budget that's set at $4,000. That's, I think, Victoria's um, talk on the policy would be really beneficial to actually review because if we're able to get that 12K, then we're able to be IOD certified. It's certifications that I think that many of us want personally, but also the upskilling. Yep. Okay. okay, righto. Some people have already had two. James hasn't spoken. Yeah, no, I'd back that up. But I, I think you know, it should be pulled for the course of the term for the training in because then if, if someone wants to do... So I, I did the IOD course, but it was a, an external board that I was on, paid for it, uh, and not a council one. But I think it's such an imperative thing that if people you know, um, wanted to do it, they essentially can't do it um, with the budget the current way it is. So I'm not saying they should be forced to do it, but if there was a desire to, well, God, we'd want them to. Um, I, I agree, just a few comments here, but... Uh, I totally agree with Tyler and I, and I think professional development is so so important that if you aren't upskilling yourself you're actually going backwards and that's you know um really not mm. um uh you doing your job in my opinion as, as an elected representative so uh, I think one's a cultural thing that I think we should really have a strong culture of um saying to people um you know if you're not upskilling yourself why not you should be um because I remember in the past and the councillor isn't here anymore but I remember someone coming to me or saying a couple of times uh, almost like a badge of honour that they hadn't used their professional development allocation since they'd been there. And I thought that's actually an embarrassment that's shameful, but they were trying, you know, they were saying it as a positive. So um, following on from that, 
both the community boards too, people don't know what they don't know. So I think having a resource, perhaps a quarterly email that goes out saying, here are a list of courses that may be of interest to someone, um, that will just prod them to turn their attention to it because there are so many things on. Uh, people will just inherently um, uh, lose, lose sight of that. And I think that it should be top of mind. Um, the other thing too is the LGNZ decision, I think is inherently connected to this because you know, in the event that our membership um, went, then um, we should be probably raising the budgets for the yeah. councillors and for community board members. Mm. Um, mm. But we can have that discussion once that decision is made. Um, personally, I actually don't think there should be a difference between um, portfolio holders or committee chairs. Um, the only committee chair actually that's here is Sam, and he can do professional development all through CCHL anyway. So I just think we'd, we'd pull it, uh, in my opinion. Um, and Sam's not here to defend himself, but um, it, it seems silly that uh, you take everyone else's down when he actually wouldn't be using this one anyway for those things. Um, and I don't really favour the bid, uh, bid funding or the group stuff just because everyone's at different levels and no one knows their skill set better than themselves or where the gaps are. And as long as they're getting the right information to say, here are some things that are coming up, this might pique your interest or have you thought about that? I think that you should leave it up to the individuals. Um, Budget should be included for forums and everything. So my just strong message would be to try and relax this as much as possible so you don't preclude things that come up. And the only other one is it's kind of like a um, uh, just the logistics of it. But I actually think um, the CEO and the mayor and everything, both having to sign it off is just cumbersome. At the end of the day, we're accountable to our community. Um, I think uh, maybe having some oversight um, that just have the mayor or deputy mayor um, in my opinion, whoever is available, perhaps sign it would be fine because I think it actually puts Mary or the chief executive in an awkward position when they're actually our employee and to be going to your employee or your one employee to ask them to sign something off, um, they're not going to say no, but it would put them in an awkward position anyway. And you'd actually rather the councillors are using their time more effectively than running around getting signatures from people for this sort of stuff. So I think that the process probably should be streamlined a wee bit. So that's my... Uh, oh, the only final point on that as well too is... Just from our conversation that we had offline, it sounds like about 48000 of the $78,000 uh, this year, for example, or last financial year was used. So that's about a 60% uptake. So, you know, in my view, I don't think that's actually good enough from an elected member's perspective. Yes, yes if I could just thank, thank you for that. Just to clarify, so um, as of Monday, download, uh, as of Monday, <laughs> out of this year's budget, 40290 had been spent approximately a third of that on travel, a third on courses, and a third on conferences. Okay, thank you. Aaron, please. I, I think it's mostly been said by Tyler and James. Uh, the, the IOD course is one that any councillor that's probably going to be here longer than a term should probably attend. And uh, Shut up, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when I got elected, I was young and knew it all. So, um, uh, but yeah, no, I totally agree. And the ones that I've worked with that have done it, but it it doesn't it doesn't work currently to go do it. So that needs needs to, like Vic said needs to be combined, and then we encourage essentially everyone that comes along to go do it. Okay. Cool. Uh, Yanni, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's always good to review policies. Um, just a bit of feedback. I think there's a difference between represent, being asked to represent council at something versus attending something for your own personal development. And at the moment, it seems very unclear. Mm -hmm. In the old system, it used to be, for example, attending LGNZ representing council um, was covered off a separate budget, not over your own individual budget. It's got to a point now where the conference costs are so expensive that you couldn't even really do, you can probably do one a year if you're lucky. Um, and a lot of the conferences now are really, they're just money raise, fundraisers for the, the umbrella organization. So their fees are really high as, uh, you know, we know there's massive increase in travel and accommodation costs, but I do think it would be good to get distinction. We used to get reports come to council to say planning conferences coming up, who, you know, who are we going to send as a council? And then we would identify, you know, the councillors or, or the staff that would attend, I think in some cases and, and. Um, that would just come to council. So we don't get notified of conferences now that happen around the city in terms of the things that, sorry, conferences that happen in relation to the city. So, you know, it seems to be just luck of the draw if someone knows something's coming up rather than any sort of system to notify us that these are the kind of key conferences. You can think about transport, waste management, 
Um, planning obviously is an obvious one. Recreation uh, and water, probably the key kind of things. There might be others. So I think it would be helpful to get a schedule of what those conferences were. But um, I think the other thing is that, I mean, obviously the RMA stuff, like we don't actually have, I mean, how many councillors or elected members even sit on those hearings anymore? So spending money on something that we're not doing uh, seems a bit odd, but, you know, I guess it's up to people's individual right to do those do those things. Likewise, we're not appointing council directors to many things anymore. I think we've, we've got a reducing amount. Um, but, yeah, uh, I would, yeah, I think welcome the opportunity to review the policy. I, I do agree with the sentiment that it seems to not cover things that you think would be sensible for individuals, and there seems to be things that, um, should not be taken out of it, that would be beneficial to us as a city. So okay. um, the only other point I was going to make is do we, has there been any thought to co communications budget for, for, for councillors? It, it seems a very, um, th there's not really a consistent approach to how we communicate. So, you know, is there an ability for councillors to have a communications budget so that we can be proactive in communicating to our communities? That's, Some that's, people that's might not use something that I've, more than I've others. Looked at. I've just focused primarily on what's in your current policy, but I will take a note of that. Celeste, did you have one more? A quick couple. Um, just in terms of like the resourcing for, you know, giving us a list of, um, you know, professional development opportunities. There was a discussion about resourcing councillors in general. I think Mary was looking at that. Is that, is that a bit of work that's underway in terms of, you know, we have one person to work with all the councillors and we did talk about resources across the mayor's office and the councillor's office. Okay. So I guess my question is, this bit of work could be folded into that because it makes sense that there's a bit more of a strategic approach. Like if we want to kind of have better processes in place relying on Helen or Phil on an ad hoc approach to kind of give us information about professional development give us a bit of a, um, a proper induction program I have to say which I don't think we have would be really helpful because I think that would really kind of um, allow us to do more with this because um, I my experience is coming on to council is you don't know what you don't know. And then by the time you figure it out, sometimes, you know, you've missed those opportunities. Um, so it'd be a bit of a shame for new councillors coming in not to immediately know what, what's available. Um, and then my final one is around the scope of the funding. I completely agree with all the comments. In terms of the professional development budget, does it include, or no, it doesn't currently include, but could we look at including access to subscriptions ourselves? So if we want to upskill through accessing we don't have access to a parliamentary library here but if we want to upskill by listening or subscribing to I don't know any sort of uh, outlet that provides you know detailed analysis of issues mm. would we be able to include that as part of our professional development budget I mean ultimately this is your policy so that, that would be something that I would be open to. Because so and it is currently defined as we've already yeah. heard quite narrowly, but whether there's um, whether there's appetite to broaden that, that would be a matter for you. Okay. So my comment would be it's our budget, so I think we should be broad enough that we spend it as we think is appropriate. And I agree with Yanni's comments about differentiating professional development between our representation as councillors at if things we're being asked to or be useful to. Okay. So right, just me lastly. Just so I'm clear, it's 78 grand at the moment, or it's 78 grand for the coming year, and we're not That's looking to increase it. Uh, the direction you gave me last year was options within the current budget envelope. Correct. Okay. Because what we've also got to be careful is, and, and just let me just tell me if I'm wrong, um, we each councillor has it's got its own separate little bucket. And if they don't decide to use it or only use half of it, it doesn't go to other councillors. Okay. Not under the current policy, okay. no. Because if we if we throw it out there, there'll be going to be awful here. We'll get a <laughs> we'll get a group of professional conference goers. And, <laughs> and Mike Mora has retired. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but we, but we could, and it would gobble it all up, and it wouldn't be there. So if it's long as it's kept separate, if for uh, different people, that's I mean, doesn't be carried over. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And we're on time.
Thank I you. Love that. Thank you. If we were to look at increasing the pot, that would be an LTP thing now, or are you talking next <coughs> annual plan? Uh, for next year, that that would be a budget for next year. Yes, so LTP. We're not yes. into pot increasing. <laughs> but the direction you gave me last year was looking at different options within the Business. same allocation. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. The screens. Um... What's next? Oh, God, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be <laughs> divert to water funding. <laughs> oh, here we go. There's no fun in funding either. No, it's changed. Now. Kilda, Libby. Kilda. Um, so hopefully this is just a quick one. Um, previous government created better off funding as part of the three water reform um, that was to recognise the impact on councils um, resulting from shifting free waters assets and service deliveries from councils to the water service entities. This council was allocated 30.61 million. Um, the criteria, criteria was broad, so um, it was basically what councils thought was important for their communities we could pick projects from, and so this council took a strategic approach um, to ensure that the projects met the government's wellbeing criteria aligned with um, Runanga priorities and um, the council's own strategic direction. So we have seven programs of work, which I'll um, come to shortly. And um, those project, projects were agreed by Department of Internal Affairs and we entered into a funding agreement um, with these projects being the permitted activities. And the funding agreement goes through to 30th of June, 2027. So the Project leads in this council, um, it's split across various units um, just because of the topics. Um, they've allocated their components of the funding right across to June 2027 for the most part. So the new government um, has reviewed all funding under the previous government's Three Waters program. You've heard a little bit about that this morning from DIA as well. Um, and Cabinet has confirmed that councils will retain the existing funding allocations of better off funding, but they have asked us if we could consider if there's any opportunity to redirect unspent better off funding to increase investment in water infrastructure or to help establish new water service delivery organisations. And this would only occur by mutual agreement, so we would have to work through that with um, the Department of Internal Affairs. And I've been through all the projects with the um, responsible project leads and had them compile what's been spent and committed and where they're at with their programs of work right through to June 2027. Um, up here on the um, PowerPoint, the table shows the allocation for each of those seven programs. Um, and the expenditure column is where we've compiled how much has been spent so far with the finance team and there is um, in brackets below some money that we have to claim for reimbursement this month and then also expenditure that is has been raised through a purchase order or something like that but I am aware that some programs also have purchase orders that are about to be raised and then paid and that so that might change how much we're going to put through our reimbursement claims. Um, okay um, two questions Tyler had his hand up first yep. and then Yanni. Good, Libby. Uh, so the graph isn't as clear as what I can read. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the city safety, yes. for example, yep. um, are we saying that the expenditure and the purchase orders up to June haven't been spent yet? So does that mean that we have to give that money back? Or this is all the money that we're committed? Uh, sorry, which column are you looking in? That's all of it, pretty much. But just, I'm just so putting city, down on the so, city safety. So city safety, for example, there's... 2.08 million allocated to that project. Mm -hmm. So far, the team has spent 1.6 million. Um, we've done a payment claim request and already, so there's only 70,000 of that that we need to claim for a month 
reimburse, uh, May monthly reimbursement claim. Um, we don't have any purchase orders currently raised in that that I know of yet that would add to that $70,000. Um, and I was speaking to Gary Watson and he expects that this the whole city safety program will be spent by August of this year. So he's um, managed to bring forward the um, anticipated close date for that, that particular program. Okay, so to be clear, anything that the council or community boards have committed to under delegation through our resolutions will be spent and we don't need to give that money back. Correct. Correct. So, so I know that there's been a whole lot of resolutions made by community boards in the past few weeks and so it will depend on whether or not we go for, for a um, payment claim request because we are still allowed to claim for reimbursement while this process is underway. Um, and so it just depends whether it would be a May or a June reimbursement claim. For um, those ones. Can okay. I just cool. clarify sense. with you, though, you, you're only talking about the current claims, but anything we've signed up and committed to a whole yes. lot of things for three or four years. Yep. And uh, DIA has actually said we were not going to change that. We have a funding agreement with you. Doesn't matter that we've got if we've got another pool of money and it hasn't not in contact or there's not a decision from a board yet. It's still in the funding agreement and council can stick to that. We've got we nothing to worry about. Is what we do. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Let's cut into the chase, Celeste. <laughs> I think it might be asking the same thing, but I'll ask again just to make sure I'm 100% clear. Mm -hmm. With the better off funding that went to safety to Linwood and New Brighton, yep. which hasn't been tagged, mm -hmm. but it is under staff delegation, is that at risk? No, it's not, nothing, nothing's at risk. No. No, nothing's so at risk. No. So basically the, the chief executive has received a letter, so we've got to respond to DIA from the chief executive about whether we've got any, like what the status of all the programs and if there is an opportunity that this council wants to redirect the spending. Um, the only risk would be if you as a council decided you no longer wanted to have the money spent on such and such and you were prepared allocate it, so to, to allocate it to three waters instead. Mm -hmm. And then, so the yeah. No, mm -hmm. no is the answer. <laughs> no. Yeah, hang on, yeah. Uh, we've got Victoria and then you. I'm clear, nothing's at risk. That's all I right. need to know. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a, a hand grenade that was lobbed in to give us all a bit of a rise to go out and actually do something, which we all did. And so everything that's allocated is safe. Yeah. Uh, just two questions. One is the trees and biodiversity, the 4.4, .4, is that just the tree planting in the parks? Um, no, trees and biodiversity has got a couple of components. It's got the urban forest planting program and it's also got a um indigenous planting and pest control um regional parks component as well so it's split within that are we able to get a breakdown of what that four million is 4.4 of what's oh think oh that's the, the purchase order what, what do we want to break it down it's i was just spent. trying to understand where the money's going it's up to them to spend it. We gave it to them. They, we don't want to be looking over their shoulder well, no, all the time. Well, in the LDP, spending. we've had a big discussion about things like pest management, weed control. But that's their department. Is that, is that money tagged into that? We've stuff? given it to them. We trust them. We can find okay. the link all right, to the report be helpful. and, and send then the, other back thing, the original report. I'm kind of wondering why, why the government would do this. Like It's not mandatory. We don't have to give anything back. It just seems to be a waste of, waste of time. But I, I wonder if there's an opportunity through this to actually talk to them about the exemption for chlorine. That's costing us a fortune. So if we could trade off around that, that might be something that would be quite sensible, right? Mm -hmm. So can we? I mean, can we ask them? Can we get progress on the on uh, the chlorine? I think it's uh, water. We could, we could not suggest to them that if they removed chlorine, we would uh, put put money to it because it's this is from DIA. It's not from the regulator. The regulator is the person that is at the moment requiring chlorine. DIA is separate from that, and they are the funding. The, but the minister is driving this, right? Yes, through DIA, though, not through the regulator. Well, maybe we could go back to the minister and say we could save a lot of money if we could just stop chlorinating our water. Mm -hmm. yeah, we can, we okay. can tell no, them. No, I'll certainly go and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone.